The next story that we're going to share with you is Murray Schultz's story. Murray's from Colcan, and I'll let his video do the rest of the talking for him. Currently, we uh, crop 75% uh, of our country in a continuous cropping rotation of uh, growing canola, wheat, lupins and barley. Uh, we've been doing that for up to 25 years now. The remaining 25% is non-arable, it's creek country or hill country and so we run a self-replacing shorthorn beef herd. The reason why we've got cattle is mostly because we don't like sheep. We don't do grazing crops because cattle tend to make a mess of country when it's wet. We do graze our stubbles over the summer, but only lightly. I'm a great believer in uh, controlling summer weeds to maximise your water use efficiency in the crop. And I think we get more benefit economically by doing that than, grazing, than leaving the weeds grow and graze the weeds. They've been great for fleabane. Come back and clean it up. 10 days after it's been sprayed. My father started no-till farming back in the late 70s. We went full no-till in the mid 80s. We started doing more and more of it. We started pushing the system more because it was handling it. Management's had to change over the time, but on the whole, we've been able to keep growing reasonable crops, getting good yields, maintaining our protein levels and maintaining our profits. The machine we use to plant with is a John Deere Conserver Pack. It's a machine that was designed in Canada. It's a 40 foot machine on 12 inch spacings. We have two centimetre GPS, which allows us to inter so. Some people would say we're probably slightly overcapitalized on our machinery, but we'd say it maximizes our labor efficiency. So I think it's a trade off. Timeliness of action is very important to us. You know, if, uh, if a crop is supposed to be sowed on a certain date, we like to be sowing on that date. And same with when, um, if the crop's ready to harvest, I want to be there harvesting it. I don't like being behind, even only a couple of days, I find that very frustrating. The farm is a partnership between my wife and myself. We have one full-time employee. My father's uh, retired, but he still fronts up a fair bit of the time and is, quite a big help to us. It's one of the challenges that we face labour. Um, we're an operation that is too big for two people, but not big enough for three. So at the moment it works really well because we're sort of two and a half full-time labour units and that works extremely well. As my father decides to slow down more, that's going to become more of an issue and it's one I'm not quite sure how I'm going to handle just yet. Climate risk and production risk are two big challenges. I think that's probably the biggest challenges facing agriculture at the moment. We've seen a much more, in, much higher increase in volatility in both markets and weather lately. Um, and that's been combined with an increase in the cost of production. So that's meant that uh, risk management has probably become the number one management issue. A livestock operation, we try and um, conserve lots of fodder, lots of silage. We've got quite a bit of silage underground, so that's a big help for us if we have a really tough spring or summer. For the cropping side, we believe that water use efficiency by taking out the summer weeds is very important. Timeliness of sowing is also very important. Uh, we do do some hedging on the cropping side, we don't on the cattle side. Grain storage and grain marketing, at the moment I'm not, a, I haven't invested in grain storage on farm. Um, I'm still waiting to see how the grain markets pan out after deregulation. Not willing at the moment to spend a lot of capital putting up grain silos. I don't like sitting in a queue at a grain silo in town either but at the same time, once it's in there, I know exactly what it is. I have no issues with weevils. I have no issues with weight loss, with getting paid, because all I have to do to sell it is make a single phone call to a buyer. Monitoring the cropping side is quite easy. It's, you just stick the costs in a computer and 
your rainfall in and those sorts of things and a good computer program will spit it back out at you. Beef side is a lot harder. It's very difficult to be able to put good numbers on how your beef operation is um, performing and it's also very and because it's so difficult it's one has to be very careful that if your numbers are wrong you're making then bad decisions because of poor data. My wife and I have weekly meetings where we sit down and discuss the week ahead, what's happening um, in the bigger picture. Um, we do have a business plan. It's a fairly succinct business plan, but it still is there. We are very fortunate. We've got excellent networks. But at the end of the day, most of it still comes down to just sitting around the kitchen table, um, taking in good information. Uh, the other thing we like to do is make use of people like our accountant, our agronomist, our stud bull supplier, our vets. Like every family, I suppose, work-life balance is always a challenge, but we as a family try and make time. We try, if we're not busy on the farm, we always try and have the weekends off so we can have good family time together. And that doesn't always happen. It's always a bit of a challenge at times to, because when you live on in your workplace, it's very hard not to take your work home with you all the time. But we do try because family life is very important to us. Mm, it varies from season to season, so that sometimes one, the farm might take precedence for a while if there's a really busy time, and then we'll make up for it later with, with flexibility when things are a bit quieter on the farm. Yep. Thank you very much, Murray, for that, and Emma. I suggest, oh, well, I suspect there's a little bit more to um, why Murray runs cattle as opposed to the fact that he just doesn't like sheep. So before you ask your questions, I'd just like you to expand on that a little bit more for us, Murray. Part of the reason is because we don't like sheep, but part of it is um, sheep didn't fit our system as well as we thought we, they might. We decided after we got out of sheep in 1995 and um, after looking at the data and so forth and deciding that we weren't making enough money out of cattle three years ago we decided that we would get back into sheep. We bought a mob of first cross ewes, went out to Andrew Boofler's and bought some good rams and, and um, and it worked pretty well. Like we were getting really good lambing rates and everything else. But and we sort of sat down and looked at 12 months ago. Looked at whether we should actually convert, send all the cattle away, and go all sheep. And there was a couple of things that really stopped us. Firstly, was the sheep didn't fit our system as well as they thought we might. We I don't want to graze my cropping country when the soil's wet. Um, that 35 years of no till, I, I think we do a lot of damage to it by grazing, running sheep on wet paddocks. Um, and then we were also uh, struggled with that balance of trying to get your lambing date so you were getting maximum fertility and then being able to turn the lambs off before harvest because there was no way any of us were going to get out of a uh, header to go chase fly blown lambs. And we really couldn't quite get that balance. The third reason was that we looked at how much capital we need to invest into our business. We didn't have a very good shearing shed. We had no sheep yards that were suitable to run the numbers of sheep we were going to look at. And at the end of the day, it also came down to the fact that we really didn't like them. None of us, none of the workforce actually liked sheep. Um, and I'm a great believer that if you don't like something, you're not going to do a very good job of it. And farming's too hard these days to not do a very good job of it and get ahead. And so we've decided to concentrate on our cattle. I've spent 25 or 30, ever since I've come home from school, so nearly 30 years um, breeding a herd, getting it where I want it to be. And we have accepted the fact that we might not be quite as profitable as some sheep operations but it suits our system, and so that's why we've decided to stick with them. Thanks, Murray. Thank 
Thanks, Murray. Um, Chris Minahan from Wagga. Just interested in your comments on in your, con your continuous cropping portion of your operation. How do you feel you're going with weeds? Do you think you you're getting them under control? Are you having to spend more money to con keep them where they are? Because that's a common um, a common thread we see in continuous cropping that weeds are becoming harder to control. Yeah, I, I'd agree. Continuous cropping combined with no till is putting a lot of pressure on your herbicides. And yep, I'm quite happy to admit that I'm um, got more resistant ryegrass than I'd care for. Um, having said that, five years ago I thought we were going to it was going to beat us, and that we would, would have to bring back a cropping phase, a pasture <coughs> phase into our cropping system. Today I don't think so. I think um, we've been doing a lot of integrated weed management. We've, we're going down the brown manure route like Bruce. Um, we're using things like the Roundup Ready Canolas. We're rowing um, all our lupin and canola. Uh, anything that passes through the header is rowed into narrow rows and then burnt. Um, and so all those sorts of things, I think we can beat it. And the paddock that's been in crop for 35 years continuously, uh, about 10 years ago, ryegrass did blow it out. We took it out of production for two years. The first year, we just brown manured it because it was a lupin crop. And the second year, we made silage. And 10 years later, it's still ryegrass free. So I think ryegrass can be beaten. It's just you've got to wear the pain. It's part of the price of uh, continuous cropping. And I think, you know... Now that we've got new products like Secure and Box of Gold and all those sorts of things, if we're a lot smarter about it, I think um, the issue is probably going to fade away. But again, it's going to take that level of management and really being very proactive and not letting go of those non-herbicide methods to keep uh, ahead of it. Thanks, Murray. Another question? Murray, we've touched a couple of times uh, with Bruce as well on grain storage and you've, you've indicated that you're not keen to invest in, in grain storage but you've also talked about <coughs> how important timeliness is to your operation and you've got a, you know, an enterprise, enterprise mix between beef and cattle and you've got a family. How, can you just talk a little bit more about grain storage? How do you manage that timeliness at, at harvest then and, and to get that balance? Um. Yeah, we run two trucks of our own and we, our, the head of size sort of matches that pretty well. We're not, I'm not against, um, if I can't get it unloaded quick enough, not against one of the trucks charging home and putting it in the, um, our own silos. And then when for some reason, if it's a cold morning or a shower or rain or something and we can't harvest, that grain gets carted then. But... Yeah, just at the moment, I'm not willing to go out and spend the amount of capital required um, to build storage. I think there's plenty of people using things like silo bags and that sort of thing. And I look at it and say, well, it's another cost. It speeds up their harvest, but then it also extends the grain delivery period and increases their risk, because I have seen one burn, and that's not a pretty sight. Um, I think it's like everything. I think each operation's got to make its own decision on how they want to handle it and then just work with it because none of them are perfect. And you've just got to wear the ones that... The, wear the problems, decide which problem you can put up with the most. OK, thanks. Murray. Uh, Murray, Peter Wynn, Charles Sturt, you over here. Um, you, you just mentioned that sheep do some damage to your country, uh, uh, well, your, your cropping country, uh, through, I assume, just uh, grazing the country and pressure of hooves, etc. Are cattle kinder to that country or do you just keep them off uh, your cropping country? We keep them off when the country's wet. Like, in the summertime, if we've got a rain event coming, we'll take the cattle off the cropping country. Having said that, we don't, they don't spend a lot of time on the cropping country because um, I'm really anal about some of the weeds. I think some paddocks got sprayed five times this last summer. Um, 
and we that's really showing up to us in um, uh, the results at the end of the year. It's dramatically increased our water use efficiency. Um, and I've, I'm like Rupert, I'm quite happy to go and do, because I've got yield mapping, I can test these things and see whether it makes a difference or not. And it's, you know, we did it, we only tried it two summers where you'd spray half a paddock and leave the other half. And, well, the second summer we only left a little square just to see if it made a difference. And, yeah, I think, to me, in the, I make so much of my profit comes out of the cropping side of the enterprise that that's what I must concentrate on. That's where the profit driver is. And grazing summer weeds in a cropping paddock is not a very profitable way to make money for your cattle enterprise either. They're not usually that great a quality. The stock don't usually like them. Some of them actually make them sick. Um, so I'd much rather them out of the system and I'd rather use store up some, uh, spring excesses and feed the stock through the summer than um, have them grazing weeds that are wasting water. Murray, Alex Russell from DPI. You mentioned the challenges you face in effectively monitoring your beef enterprise. Um, do you have any comments about what would make a difference to, to enable you to do that? Is it, is it the computer packages? Is it knowing what data to collect, collecting the data in the first place? There's a couple things. For me, it's, I'm probably not as um, diligent keeping my records with the cattle side as I am with the cropping side. You know, the cropping side, it's very easy to just go, you know, this is this expense, so bang in it goes. I think in a mixed farming system, um, I believe it's a lot harder to say, OK, I'm making silage off a paddock for weed control. So who wears the cost for that? Is that the cropping side or is that the cattle side? And then I put that silage in the ground and don't use it for four years because I don't need it and then a drought comes along. And so do I value it at the low price of when I put it in the ground or do I value it at the high price that it's worth if I sold it to someone else? Um, that makes it much more difficult to give a good... In my mind, it makes it much more difficult to give good figures against the cattle side versus the cropping. And because they're probably my lesser interest, I'm probably... Um, I put it in the too hard basket and go, don't know, I'll just... I like my cows, they got to eat, life goes on. <laughs> You know. Thank you very much, Murray. We actually do have another question from Condo, which is great, so we'll cross to that question now, and then that will be our final question for Murray before we go into our buzz session. Um, the question is, um, Murray, you, you've spoken about your water use efficiency. Um, a few of the people here want to know what your formula is for working out that water use efficiency, and what are you aiming for as far as kilograms per millimetre? I take uh, my summer rainfall from the 1st of November through to the 1st of April and halve it. Uh, I take my growing season rainfall and uh, take off 150 millimetres for evaporation. And so um, that's giving us, oh, it varies. The best I've done is 19 kilos to the, uh, to the millimetre average. Um, some paddocks were actually doing 23, 24, and some were only doing 15, 16. So I would really like to be doing that consistent 20 kilograms. Um, but I think it might have been Bruce that said, you know, in the dry years it's actually much easier to be, uh, get much better water use efficiencies. In the wet years, they just, it doesn't make much difference. So, um, but having said that, like this year, most people would regard this, uh, this year as a wet year for us. But it's actually a decile two growing season rainfall for us. Um, if we hadn't had a wet summer, it would be um, pretty ordinary. And um, I've seen people in our area that didn't do any summer weed control. Um, they've had dust blowing off their paddocks and we've been running at the sort of situation where if I got another inch of rain, if I got two inches of rain this week, I'd be, um, have too much water and have water logging. I've needed to use the diff lock 
when I've been spreading urea last week still. So um, I'd much rather go into the spring um, in a situation where I've got a full water profile than be going in where the dust's blowing off the top. Okay, thank you, Murray. Let's break into our five-minute buzz session now. So ideas, issues, discuss them among your table. Write them down. And, and just a little reminder again, if you're happy to leave all the information you've written on your table, Shelley and her team will find that really useful in terms of determining what was important to you out of today.